The reason why I'm a little disappointed that we're wrapping up the Colossians series today is it's kind of fun having that music play when you, you come out. You know, it's kind of like the Rockies coming up to bat. That, that, that's my song, I guess. I, <laughs> I'm going to miss that. Love it. Um, a, a trait that many of you know about me is that I, um, I am a goodwill and arc shopaholic. I will pull off if I sense the Spirit is leading me to an ark store that I've never been to before. And I don't just buy a bunch of stuff. I'm always looking for uh, that deal. Or, and I have a lot of stuff that's brand new and so forth at, at Goodwill. And, and um, I, I love finding a deal. And, and, and I have a problem in that when somebody says, hey, I like those shoes, and I'll go, yeah, two bucks at Ark. Or, great pants, where'd you get those? Ah, Goodwill, $5.99, but it was 50% off, and I had a little coupon on uh, Martin Luther King Day. Or, someone will say, hey, nice shirt. I go, yeah, $5 at Kohl's two years ago, and so forth. I'm one of those kinds of people. I just love a great deal, uh, and I'm not afraid to talk about it. Well, I came across a little wooden box uh, at Ark a number of years ago, and it was a, it was a uh, beautiful wood. Um, I estimated its value at roughly $7 million, and it was, uh, it, the, the tag on it said $2.99, but th they didn't know. The, um, and the box, I didn't notice at the time, actually had a covering on the bottom, and, and when I put it in the bag, and I took it out of the bag later at home, um, the bottom had actually fallen up a little bit, and there was a letter that was underneath that, the, the covering on the bottom. And it was a really old letter. Um, okay, I'm sorry. A letter, people, or th people used to uh, take out a pen or a pencil, and, and they'd use this thing called paper, and they'd write on it. Um, and the letter was written by a young soldier uh, to his family. Uh, it, it didn't appear that he was married, but he was asking about how Uncle Herman was doing. And it was asking about other people in the family and so forth. And, you know, it was cool to read this letter from someone from a long time ago. Um, but I didn't know who Uncle Herman was. What a difference when you know who the people are that you're writing to. And as we wrap up this beautiful manifesto of the Christian faith, this powerful letter of Colossians written to the people at Colossae to remind them that God's grace is powerful, to remind them that God is full, that Jesus is 100% God so that he could bear our sins. And Jesus is 100% human so that he could take our place on the cross. That because he's risen from the grave, we too will rise up in, into a new life. And that we don't have to live in an old way of thinking and living and being, but rather God became the most important knowledge of all, a God of restoration. God's plan from the beginning to the end has never changed a relationship with us for eternity. That forgiveness is not just a possibility, it is our reality in Jesus Christ. And when you get to the last part of Colossians, it's real easy to check out because you come across names of people that you may not know. In fact, we'll come across those names right now. 
from Colossians chapter 4, 7, Tychicus will tell you about my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him, and Jesus, who is called Justice, these are, only, uh, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always, struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and the Hierapolis, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, Write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Here in this amazing letter, the Apostle Paul is talking about people, people of the church. The word church literally comes from the word Lord, kyriakos. Kyriakos means Jesus Christ is Lord that wherever the Lord's grace and forgiveness are present, that is where the church is to be found. Not contained only in a building of people gathered together or a household, but wherever people who have been given the free gift of God's love in Christ Jesus go, that is the church going with them. And the Apostle Paul is writing this amazing letter of Colossians, and he wraps up the letter, including people who were meaningful and acting as the church, and then also with final words that should take our breath away. So let's take a look at a couple names, Tychicus and Arist uh, Aristarchus. Those were the top two names I wanted for my kids. Uh, but uh, somehow I lost, I lost the bet on that one. About uh, Tychicus, Tychicus. Tychicus uh, and Aristarchus, both of them are mentioned five times in the New Testament. We don't have a whole bunch of information about them, but we do know that they were important, faithful, loyal workers in the body of Christ. They were like folks in our community here and on our campus in Wash Park. They were the go-to people who said, if it's going to get done, we're going to be the people who do it. Um, we're gonna, you're going to find us faithful. This morning I had a chance just to say to someone, I am so thankful for how loyal and faithful you are in this community. You truly make a difference. And Tychicus and Aristarchus were, were two of those faithful folks who did what they said they were going to do. Now, Tychicus, we don't know for certain, but he likely he was more of an Asian descent. And then the early church talked about being someone who was martyred for his faith, and that when he died so, he did with great dignity with the name of Jesus upon his lips. Eric also only mentioned five times. Um, we have almost no history of him other than the fact that he had joined Paul on his third missionary journey and also the fact that he was from Thessalonica. So not a lot of info, but it isn't, isn't it amazing that even though he didn't realize perhaps all the difference he was making back then, that his name would be recorded as someone who supported and encouraged the forgiveness of sins going forward. 
here in these two gentlemen, we find good, old, faithful, loyal people serving joyfully. And that's what I love in our two campuses and two places where the church, people set apart, faithful and loyal in their giving, in their doing, in their serving, and so forth. Then we get to another character. His name is Mark. Mark uh, was known as uh, one of the younger disciples, not the youngest, but he was a younger disciple. And we actually have a gospel. That's those first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark indicates himself as the writer, uh, quite likely toward the end of Mark, when he uh, is uh, in the garden and he's running away and someone grabs the cloak that he's wearing and he runs naked into the night. Why would he include such an interesting detail? You see, Mark did an amazing thing with the writing of the gospel, showing the uh, he, the word immediately is used 47 different times. He's the man of action, the man of let's go for it. But before he got to the man of action and let's go for it, to the apostle Paul, he was known as the quitter. He and Paul came to odds, and Mark walked out on the job. He said, I'm out of here. Goodbye. I want nothing to do with this. And the Apostle Paul didn't put on his big boy pants either. And he said, fine, fine. Argument, done. Fine, fine. Out the door. So Barnabas, son of encouragement is what that name means, does his job by stepping in to two brothers who are having a big fight. And he woos Paul and Mark to say, as brothers in Jesus, we got to work this out. And so the quitter is welcomed wholeheartedly back into the flock. The quitter is received back in again, and all the past hurt is laid at the feet of Jesus. There's another character, Onesimus. There's a New Testament book, which N.T. Wright, an amazing theologian, love his work, believes that the book of Philemon was one of the most practical social justice, the way that it implied justice being lived out. How do Christians now live in a world where power is misused? How do they operate differently? How do we live differently in a world that misuses its power all over the place? So how should Christians put this into action? And the book of Philemon demonstrates that. That before God, there is no difference between king and pauper. Before God, we all need the same thing. And if God is our father and Christ is our brother and the Holy Spirit is given to us, and it is, then we are family. Then, then we are to treat each other regardless of our gender, regardless of our background, regardless of our class, regardless of uh, anything. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus. And Onesimus was a runaway slave who, under Roman law, was a felon who, given the nature of the court at the time, could put him to death. But Paul reminded Philemon, this is your brother, this is my brother, whatever debt he has, I will take it upon me just as Jesus took the debt of our sin upon himself. So we have the, the story in Colossians about faithful workers being a part of the church. And we have in the story of Colossians, the writings of Colossians, that the, the quitters, people who have run away for a while, who abandoned the gospel, who abandoned the church, are supposed to be welcomed in as beloved saints. And here we have a felon, someone who could be marked for the rest of his life or his life could be taken away from him, who because he is connected to Jesus means he is fully restored, he is to be treated not as a second-class citizen, but as a part of the family of God.
Archippus. Archippus, the apostle, writes an interesting phrase to him. Archippus, make sure you complete what you've begun. Now, I don't think he's talking about his science project. Um, I don't think he's talking about, you know, um, the chastisement. The Apostle Paul isn't known for chastising people in that way. I see it as a word of encouragement. Hang in there, dude. You got this. Your work makes a difference. You're not forgotten, and you are not without value in the kingdom. When I came to faith as a teenager, there was Carol, and there was Brian, and there was Karen, and several others who gave me encouragement, who said, Michael, you have life, and your life, as different as you are, God has things in store for you. Hang in there with the difficulties of your family. Hang in there as you discover who you are. God has begun this good work in you, and he's going to bring it to completion. They were encouragers who spoke into my life. That's what Archippus needed, and that's what Paul provided. Brothers and sisters, one of the greatest gifts that we can give to other people is encouragement. God's not finished with you yet. God is greater than that. There's more that God, the Holy Spirit is up to here than you could ever imagine. And as we gather in our life groups together, as we gather in one another's homes and the homes of our community, those are the encouragement places where we get to breathe life and hope into each other. I should probably include one other person, and that's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a murderer. The Apostle Paul was who someone towards the end of his ministry wrote these words, although I am the least of all the apostles. He came to an understanding that God had the ability to forgive him for being zealous for the wrong things. He was more concerned about being right than he was about being righteous. He was more concerned about living up to an old standard of living and being. The church had to look like this. Otherwise, it wasn't church. And the Holy Spirit showed him the blindness of his ways by opening his eyes to an understanding that the church is but a group of forgiven people equally celebrating the forgiveness of God. That there's not a hierarchy in the church other than Jesus Christ is Lord. And the Apostle Paul, who loved the laws, who loved the rules, who loved the way it always has and always will be, is the very same one by the power of the Holy Spirit who said, love is patient and it is kind and it doesn't envy and it doesn't boast and it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. That's the transformation of what happens when we experience forgiveness. That was made evident in the way imperfect Paul sought to live out the grace God's given to him. So I'm going to wrap up with an illustration, and then I'm going to, with the final words of Colossians. Some folks have this view of the church. The church is a bunch of people holding hands, and in this illustration, are they facing inward or are they facing outward? They're inward. Hey, this is our little clique. This is our group. This is our gathering. This is what we do here. And trying to 
bust into one of these circles, that's a real challenge. That's why when you go to church on vacation and you walk in the door, hey, okay, you don't do that. But you walk in the church and you go, this church says it's a friendly church, but really it's a church of friends. And I'm not a friend. I don't know how I could possibly bust into that circle there. And then there are some churches that are so focused on outreach, which is, yay. Outreach means this. That's a a term meaning this. Outreach is when our sole focus is on reaching other people who don't know Jesus. And we've become so focused on that that we've lost our connection with each other. That, that there's an understanding it's not just about taking the gospel to the world, but it's about allowing other people into our lives to bring God's good news of forgiveness and grace to us. So it's not just everyone looking inward or everyone looking outward. It's actually different than that. Um, I've uh, asked the praise team, our worship leaders today, to help me give another illustration of what the what the the shape of the church should look like. People living in the forgiveness of sins, what would that look like? And so um, they were really excited when I asked them to do this. Okay, so we're now going to come up with the perfect shape of the church on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three, go for it. Doesn't that look perfect? Now with the other hand, just reach out. The one that's free. How many different shapes could this take? Whole bunch of different shapes. Good. I, you, you got goofy for me. I'm really grateful for that. Notice that they're connected one with another. And notice also that they're reaching out. That's what we're seeking for the Washington Park community. That's what we're seeking for the Highlands community. Last week, my heart, great delight when I met with Uh, Larry McGrewer, Uh, in fact, Larry's here this morning with Salt of the Earth Ministry. And um, Larry gets this better than just about anybody I know, that the church is a living organism that isn't designed to get people into a building, but designed to get people into a relationship with Jesus and also a relationship with each other. If we were to do a a hymn that would describe what I believe Jesus wants his church to look like. I I think this is the hymn here by Toby Keith. Um, I love this bar. Okay, so the words to, and I love the song, I love this bar. I do, because it's two chords, um, and even I can play it. Okay, Um, and the, the words of the song go like this. We got winners, we got losers, chain smokers and boozers. We got yuppies and bikers, thirsty hitchhikers, and the girls next door dress up like movie stars. And you know it's a contemporary hymn because it's mm mmm, right? I love this bar. The body of Christ is made up of faithful, loyal workers. The body of Jesus is made up of, of people who quit. And God invited back in, made up of felons, people who uh, were well deserving, deserving of punishment, and they were restored, and their status was regained. And then also the church is led by people who've experienced the grace of God when most people thought that wasn't even possible. And perhaps that's the reason that the book of Colossians wraps up with these words. Grace be with you. Now that's not, have a good day, nice writing, kiss mom for me. Grace be with you. We say it pretty simply, but for them it was the foundation of why they gathered. Grace. God's righteousness, God's goodness at Christ's expense. Forgiveness, not just for a few, but forgiveness for all.